Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, we're just going to take about two minutes and let others join, and we will get started any minute. All right, everyone, welcome and good afternoon. My name is Marty Goodrow. I am the Regional Resource Director for Care and Treatment Centers in Connecticut and Westchester, New York. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the webinar topic is Understanding and Navigating the Continuum of Care When Treating Substance Use Disorder. As a reminder, this will be conducted as a webinar format, meaning all participant microphones will be muted. Uh, we will not be able to see or hear you during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A or chat feature. Um, depending on the volume of questions, if we can't get to your question before the end of the hour, we will have someone from our team follow up with you directly. Today's presentation is eligible for one continuing education credit. We would like to thank our educational partner, CE Learning Systems, for assisting in providing these credits through co-sponsorship with the American Psychological Association. Please note that in order to receive your credits, you will need to complete the post webinar evaluation. A link will be emailed to you directly after the presentation from cego.com. After finishing the evaluation, you will have immediate access to your certificate of completion. So today I'm proud to introduce our presenter, Eric Rodriguez, as the Educational Resource Director for Karen's Education Alliance Department. Eric Rodriguez oversees education, training, development, and learning initiatives, focusing primarily on corporate and organizational education. Prior to accepting the educational role in 2021, Eric worked as a behavioral health therapist for Karen's Grandview program, providing individual and family therapy to patients and the families. He facilitated groups, offering education lectures, uh, and helping to set up aftercare plans. He has, he has advanced his education in co-occurring disorders, specifically related to anxiety and his training cognitive processing therapy for trauma. He began working at Karen in 2017 as a therapist for a men's program and moved to Grandview in 2019. Eric is a licensed social worker in PA and has a certification in advanced addiction and drug counseling. Eric has a bachelor's degree in clinical psychology and a master's degree in clinical social work from Millersville University. We'll now hand over the presentation to Eric Rodriguez to get us started. Thank you for joining us. Eric, take it away. Thanks, Martin. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, talk about a uh, continuum of care uh, in regards to substance use disorders. Um, couple of learning objectives today that we're gonna talk through is identification of substance use disorder in the new DSM-5 placement identification, factors affecting treatment of substance use disorder, um, talk about ASAM placement criteria, uh, discussion on different levels of the continuum of care and navigation of the continuum of care with direct client, 
utilizations of assessments and history for practice behavior and planning for the continuum care placement and best treatment course. The development of evidence-based skills to support your clients in self-determination and self-resiliency and discussing the ethical implications of working with clients with substance use disorders. So I wanna first off start, oh, sorry, excuse me. I wanna first off start with um, this picture here, identifying substance use disorders like identifying other um, mental health um, or other environmental factors that affect the individual is oftentimes does not present as we see our clients in the office or, or, or regular day. Um, most people are not going to evidently let you know that just by them walking into your office. Um, so this is a picture of all these wonderful people. They're smiling. Oftentimes when I would see my clients and they would walk into the office, um, they would not be reading, it would not be evident on their face that there was uh, substance use or other behavioral health issues going on. So there, it is a complex uh, question when you start to talk about assessments and diagnosing, and then also um, placements and continuum care effects for your clients. So there are some symptoms associated with substance use disorders. What we call them are we call observable um, symptoms. Um, I don't like to talk, talk about them being, um, you know, that these would dictate a substance use disorder. Um, there's a lot of life experiences going on with individuals, for instance, divorces, um, grief and loss concerns, um, you know, uh, comorbid concerns, whether that be uh, medical issues that might also present with symptoms associated with substance use disorder. Um, but these observables can at least give us an understanding or some, some inclination that there might be a substance use disorder underlying. Physical observations, cold sweats, racing pulse, the nausea, as we can see that with um, dilated pupils, for instance, is one of those key observables, um, the, the pinning of the pupil in the eyes. Physi uh, psychological observations and anxiety, depression, hopelessness, um, the wholesale personality changes that come in effect of severe substance use disorders when you start to move down the continuum. Um, emotional observations, um, mood regulations, anger, stress tolerance, easy frustratable, and environmental observations with lateness, really the unavailability um, scattered and, and oftentimes what, what I would see and what would drive um, some, some people into treatment for substance use disorder, whether that outpatient or inpatient is some of the relational effects um, that it's having with their partners, um, maybe work relationships, uh, child relationships with children. And when you're talk, talking about substance use disorder, we're talking about a spectrum or continuum. I like to use the word spectrum. I use them interchangeably, spectrum or continuum, um, to really be able to psychoeducate maybe families or maybe even clients themselves on what we're talking about here. I think with the rise in understanding autism, and now we call that the kind of a spectrum disorder, um, people really have a, have a better understanding of the, when you're talking about a spectrum or a continuing, continuum, it being this, um, you know, the severity is, 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 and the symptoms can be wide. Um, and I was blessed to be able to really do my education um, when the DSM-4 was available. And then I did my postgraduate education, the DSM-5 was, was installed by that point in time. So I did most of my advanced education um, uh, when the DSM-5 was present, which, uh, which was nice for me because I didn't have to change all the language um, that we have had to do over the last decade as we've transitioned from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5. But the DSM-5, when it comes to substance use disorders, we've really um, let go of the notion of substance abuse and substance dependence, and we've now linked them together in this continuum of substance use disorder all the way from mild to severe. And here's just some, some other, um, uh, the diagnostic criteria for the DSM-5 for substance use disorders, um, all the way from one to 11. And uh, as you can see, the severity level, two to three mild, four to five moderate, and six or more severe. 
Um, I'll just take the first one, taking the substance in larger amounts over a longer period of time than you want to, or wanting to cut down or stop using the substance, but not managing to do so. Um, and what I found in working with clients is some of these uh, questions, um, if you're, if you're giving them like it's a, uh, you know, it's a yes or no answer. Um, a lot of clients will tell you no. However, if you start to ask more questions, um, there might be, it might elevate them to actually say yes. So for instance, wanting to cut down or stop using the substance, but not wanting to, a client might say, well, no, I've never wanted to cut down or stop using. Um, however, you know, asking the question, if you know that they have a part or has your partner ever asked you to stop using or cut down? Well, yes, they did. Was your intent to do so? Yes, it was. Were you successful at that? No, I wasn't. This might allow them to have better understanding of their own substance use and then also give you a better guide to actually um, identify the substance use disorder and the accurate severity level within the substance use disorder. There are many factors in treatment of substance use disorders. The top left, the biology, um, the predisposition to addiction. We know now um, through the scientific research and literature that's out there um, that there is uh, biological factors in the, the presentation of substance use disorders and people that have a predisposition um, or a family history of substance use disorders are more likely than um, at a more of a risk to uh, develop a substance use disorder in their lifetime. Bottom left, trauma or adverse childhood experiences also affect um, the potential factors in treatment of substance use disorder and also, um, you know, the, uh, the potential for development of substance use disorders. Co-occurring anxieties, depressions, um, there are certainly environmental factors, whether that be uh, the area in which you live, uh, socioeconomic statuses, um, family systems. Um, there are a vast amount of family dynamics that go on um, that can certainly factor in in the treatment of substance use, um, whether that be intact families, um, whether that be divorces, whether that be separations, um, whether um, you have a, uh, an individual maybe drinking within this family system or using within this family system, all of these effects will factor in in the treatment. And personality um, traits or other personality disorders that might accompany um, substance use disorders should also be uh, evaluated, assessed, ruled in, or ruled out. So to continue, I want to talk a little bit more about factors. Um, you know, assessment is a very, very important part of this process. Um, addiction is a primary condition. Um, and what, what this means is really the symptoms of addictions, when you start to talk about personality, when you start to talk about personality traits, when you start to talk about other co-occurring anxiety disorders, even comorbid, when you start talking about, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the physical effects um, that might even occur with substance use disorders um, definitely can be symptoms related to substance use um, and directly related to and not, um, not don't exist outside of the substance use. So really the important thing is to rule out whether there is a substance use disorder um, so that you can properly evaluate other behavioral health and mental health and physical health issues that might be underlying the cause of substance use disorder. Um, so as we saw in the first picture, addiction can have a varied look and degree um, when it talks about mild addiction or severe addiction or when you're talking about um, the individual, whether they are uh, gender or races or socioeconomic statuses or work or employments, it, 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 is, it does not discriminate it's, again, it's across all populations um, and it does not, uh, it definitely has that varied look and degree of it. This is the ASAM definition of addiction. Um, this is the, the, the new, uh, came out, it was uh, 
was edited and revised in 2019. Addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those of other chronic diseases. Um, ASAM uh, will look at the dimensional criteria associated with the American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, or ASAM, um, and they really have uh, spearheaded definitions and some of the diagnostical criteria that we use for placement. This is the old definition of ASAM. Um, I really love this definition. It is really a lot, goes into a lot of the bio, I'm not gonna read this, goes into a lot of the biology um, and it got, goes into a lot of the classifications within um, the disease of addiction. And um, as a clinician, it makes a lot of sense to me. I understand the change as it, um, if you were not a clinician and you're reading that definition of ACE, this older definition of ASAM that was produced in 2011, um, it might be a little overwhelming. So, um, but as a clinician, I love this definition as well. So here's the six dimensions or the multidimensional assessment uh, for the American Society of Addiction Medicine when it comes to placement criteria. They really look at the holistic whole being approach um, and the biopsychosocial uh, assessment element of the individual. So I'm going to briefly go through these. Um, dimension one, looking at acute intoxica intoxication or withdrawal potential. The, this is looking at um, previous treatment experiences, type of substance, duration of use. Um, have you had, um, for instance, when you start looking at alcohol and ben benzodiazepine use, which is, uh, is, is oftentimes related to seizure risks for detoxification and withdrawal. Um, you know, have they had seizures in the past? What we know is if someone had previously had a seizure related to um, substance use, they are in uh, the propensity of having a seizure um, during the current withdrawal or the current detoxification is higher. It's a greater risk. Um, dimension two, looking at biomedical conditions or complications. Um, that is looking anything from uh, pancreatitis to liver disease all the way down to chronic um, migraines. This doesn't have to be direct results of substance use. Again, we're taking a holistic approach. We're looking at the whole individual. Dimension three, looking at emotional, behavioral, cognitive uh, uh, conditions or complications. This is really the psychology component of um, the ASCM dimension. So uh, anxieties, co-occurrings, um, mood disorders, other uh, psychological uh, uh, co-occurring conditions that might be present. Dimension four is readiness to change and really just a, a exploration of the change element of the client that you're working with. Um, this is the old, you know, the, the pre-contemplative, contemplative, the stages of change model within the dimension four. Dimension five, relapse, continued use or continued uh, problem potential. Uh, looking at previous uh, histories, relapses, treatment experiences, experience with um, recovery, sobriety, really uh, looking at all those different features that come into play in Dimension 5. And Dimension 6, recovery and living environment. Um, this could be an individual's current living environment, um, whether it's a healthy, uh, supportive environment for uh, return to that return to that living environment. Uh, for the individual and in support of their recovery. It can also um, look at a couple of different other, and this is really my focus right now is working in this dimension um, and how do we support individuals um, returning from or uh, going through outpatient treatment and how can we best support them? So dimension six, you can see all the different features in there. And uh, really what, what, what I am uh, solely working on right now is looking at recovery friendly work environments and recovery centric uh, organizations and how do we actually support 
individuals that are seeking behavioral health and substance use uh, treatments in outpatient and inpatient um, and otherwise, and how do we support them in a vocation um, and how do we support them as employees and employers. So uh, this recovery in living environment, this dimension six can be a very big element in uh, successful maintenance of recovery. So when you're working with your client and you're working at an exploration of this environment or their environment, um, really, I, I think about exploration with your client, empower that explanate, ex, exploration, help your client in their desires and their want to change, and also determine the external barriers or the potential barriers within their environment that might um, impact their ability to change and their want to be had to, to live a healthy lifestyle. Um, navigate and support this desire for healthy change. Um, asset development. So identify current assets that will support them in their goals of sobriety um, and encourage the possibility for change. When I entered the field, um, you know, a decade ago, I, I was kind of, uh, you know, inserted into all of these different treatment options that were available. Um, and it becomes almost overwhelming, at least for a new clinician as they walk into this, as, as the inpatients and the outpatients and the partial hospitalizations and, um, you know, what level goes with um, what the individual is facing and the client is facing regarding their substance use. So I just wanted to, I'm not gonna go through each individual, but I wanted to give you an overview of the treatment options that are out there. Um, and I spent seven years working in really an acute hospitalization inpatient facility. Um, so I was looking at you know placement from the most uh, significant um, uh, hospitalization inpatient level and then placement underneath and how do we get someone reintegrated back into their living conditions um, versus going from the opposite, maybe doing an outpatient and how do we move someone into a more, um, more comprehensive or more uh, intensive level of care. So uh, inpatient or residential, really looking at um, that, that taking a client and isolating them and giving them a, a full continuum of services in which they live in. Um, outpatient treatment can be varied. You talk about the partial hospitalization program, which could be about five days a week, all the way into the intensive outpatient programs, which are three days a week, um, and a varied amounts of hours throughout. Individual counseling um, typically can be um, one time per week, can be, be several times per week. Um, but really looking at um, how do we help that client navigate uh, their current situations and then hopefully get them, um, if they do, do indeed suffer from maybe a moderate to severe use disorder um, to the level of treatment in which they need to be in. Monitoring and coaching has been over the last 10 years been a really up and coming um, uh, support system for people in recovery and people trying to recover. Um, very, very good. I've had really fantastic results um, with my clients that have engaged in monitoring and coaching. Um, oftentimes, I do not only recommend uh, potentially monitoring and coaching, but also I uh, attach that with some kind of in-person individual counseling, um, specifically for uh, other areas outside of um, uh, substance use or, or, or uh, you know, screenings or, or, or monitoring of those substance use issues. And then we have the mutual health programs uh, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Smart Recovery. Um, there's Celebrate Recovery, there's Recovery Dharma, there's a lot of um, self-help, 12-step uh, self-help groups out there, mutual help groups out there to also help support individuals um, trying to make some life change. So when you're looking at the identify, identification of placement within this continuum, um, we also look at the continuum of care, levels of care as it's often referred to. And we look at this on a continuum or spectrum as well, all the way from outpatient to inpatient or, or hospitalization level and everything in between. So there is a lot of different options um, for placement. Um, and and you are also trying to match that uh, severity level within the substance use for also proper placement within the continuum of care. 
This is, uh, I refer to this as the staircase model. I've always referred to it as uh, the staircase model. Um, however, I tried to look this up online. I, I, I figured I just adapted it from some literature or some textbook, which I had read over the last decade and a half. Um, but I went back in a search and couldn't find it. But oftentimes with my clients, I would actually have, I would actually draw a staircase with them and look at the levels of care with within that staircase where they were and where and when we were trying to determine placement and where what they uh, would like to do and what the appropriate level of care we'd work through that staircase so for instance in the inpatient model that would be all the way at the top and what i would if someone was trying to go from an inpatient 30-day extensive treatment experience to an individual um, once a week outpatient kind of down there at the bottom of the staircase, um, I would try to help them to put some other stop gaps in place in the middle of that staircase, whether that be um, additional therapy, whether that be an intensive outpatient, whether that be monitoring and coaching, potential different living accommodations, um, if that would be warranted to help support them in long-term recovery goals. Um, I'm a visual guy, so it, and when in working with my clients, it really helped them and also myself to really see where they were and help to guide them in the direction of their continuum of care and their placement. The other big thing with ASAM is it's a, it's a really good guide. Um, not only is it a guide for the practitioner and placement and level of care assessments, um, it also removes the bias um, that we all certainly have um, and certainly even your clients have, um, whether that be regarding substance use or behavioral health or environmental factors or family effects. Um, it also guides ethical practice. Um, we're gonna talk about self-determination and, and uh, self-reliance, um, but the client has a duty for self-determination. They have, that is a, that is a basic prim, premise of, of, uh, of practice with individual clients is their right for determination. So it's really to also create um, their ability to make guidance and determination for themselves. Um, keeps us under within our codes of conduct, conduct and also can mitigate conflict barriers. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of the, you know, the client, uh, the therapeutic relationship, um, and hopefully this can mitigate some, some potential tension within that relationship if a client might not feel that they're ready to maybe go from an outpatient to an inpatient level for their substance use disorder. Um, you can walk through ASAM criteria, you can walk through um, levels of care assessment and really be able to inform your client in the decisions that they're making. Ultimately, there is, that is their decision to make though. And as ASAM looks at holistic care, and I think uh, really nationally and globally, we've, we've turned to really a holistic care approach um, for treatment. Um, this allows for the treatment planning, it allows for levels of care assessments, it allows for the ability for self-assessment and self-diagnosis. Um, it gives the clinician the ability for, for proper clinical assessments, for treatment planning and goal planning within that treatment plan, um, allows for reevaluation of progress. I know in an inpatient level, um, we, ha we did weekly um, ACM evaluations. Again, these, are, these should change over time. So we need to create some fluidity and some, some ability to track and, and uh, monitor progress. Um, also identifies risk, risk factors and potential service needs. When you're working with your clients, um, clients are savvy. Um, they know when you're just determining a level of care because that is based on X symptoms, that's where you should go. Um, so really the ability to really work through your own assessment, believe in your, in your own skills and, and, um, and what you would like for the betterment of your client, you will actually be able to give them a sense of buy-in to, to wanting what's best for them. So your clients definitely can feel what you're feeling. They can definitely feel whether um, you are in firm belief, belief in, in, in what you're dictating that next level of care would be for them, whether you're trying to refer them into uh, or refer them out of. 
always remind, remember this is your clients are amazingly vulnerable. Um, those that suffer from substance use disorders, uh, the, the trauma afflicted of uh, individuals that oftentimes suffer from substance use disorders. So really having that empathetic response. Motivational interviewing is highly effective when you're starting to talk about navigation of continuum of care or working with clients with substance use disorders. Um, certainly uh, kind of behavioral therapies and dialectical behavioral therapies and other therapeutic approaches, um, you know, hone your skills so you can, you know, uh, be able to deliver whatever your client needs. But motivational interviewing is highly effective um, in, in continuum of care talk. Work through with your client. You are a team. Um, this is your client, your, your client's uh, uh, self-determination and effect of their life. Um, you're really there to help guide and support them in moving them forward along that continuum. Um, and certainly we do not control the outcome of this. Um, question mark compliant patient. I mean, I know we've, uh, I'm sure everyone has been there when you, you might give a recommendation or you might ask a client whether they'd consider doing something and they're like, absolutely, this is fantastic. Um, you know, I definitely want to do it. Um, we have also probably seen our defiant client where you might have a recommendation for them or you might have a um, uh, recommendation to do something and they want nothing to do with it. What I'd like to say about compliant defiant clients um, is that it doesn't really exist. A, a client could be compliant one day and defiant the next day or vice versa. Um, the response should not dictate whether someone is given a recommendation or not given a recommendation or whether someone um, will or will not follow through with um, with with a potential goal or, or, or plan of action um, that's defined by the clinician. Um, it's really, again, you to help work them through that, regardless of whether what their reaction is to that. There are many different assessments out there: um, medical, psychological, social, spiritual, cultural, family assessments. We we always did the psychosocial assessments. Um, however, uh, in the inpatient. Uh, working uh, for Karen and inpatient is we have a whole medical team, psychological team. So we have multiple disciplines hitting the different dimensions. Um, I know certainly some individuals are, are taking all the assessments and they're kind of the sole producer of all the assessments. Um, but we really focused on as, uh, as the licensed uh, counselors, licensed social workers, um, psychologists, the psychosocial assessments. Um, but these assessments are critical and not only guides the treatment planning, but also guides the ACM um, evaluation. It's also a tracking system for continuum of care evaluations. It allows for that fluidity and that change and that always altering um, working document that's kind of always evolving and, uh, and allows us for, for constant assessment within it. Um, and really, are, are we comfortable asking the difficult questions? You know, there are some potentially questions, and as, as my careers went on, I've been more comfortable asking, but I remember starting out and even a couple of years in, um, some questions that I would have to ask that were uncomfortable for me. Um, and are we asking those questions? I'll give you one, for instance, it's that one that comes up often is the, some of the psycho, so, psychosexual assessments when it comes to, um, you know, number of partners, for instance. Um, I, get, I give, uh, there's been multiple times where a client will say, well, the normal number, well, normal is a relative statement, so I don't really know what normal means, um, and, and I wouldn't say that to a client. Um, the question would be, well, well, what does that look like for you? Um, and really being able to ask the questions beneath the questions to go a little bit deeper so, you, the, so that the clinician has a better understanding and a, and a more clear picture of exactly um, what the client is dealing with and what, what, how, and how the clinician can best, um, best help that client move forward. History can tell us a lot. Um, not only is the assessment and evaluation, but just the history of the client itself, so the family systems, family of origin, aspects of the client. Um, it allows us to understand how that client might react, what might trigger that client. Um, 
current and future? What reinforcers or what, what, um, what positive reinforcers can you give as the clinician to enforce that client um, to, uh, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's appreciation and really giving that client that, that continued appreciation as they move down that continuum moving down those goals. How to motivate the client, what, what the client biases might be, what, how did they grow up, what did they see, um, so that you might not necessarily uh, go in a direction within a session that might go against uh, something, maybe even a belief system that the client might have. I put time of day in here. I'm a certified uh, cognitive process therapist for trauma. And the one thing about uh, some of the trauma aspects when you're treating the trauma clients is time of day or you know environmental aspects um, that might be triggering to individuals that have, have different life experiences. So being very intentional and uh, intentional with what you're, with how you're saying things, what time of day, environmental factors, all of those different pieces. Um, this can serve as a therapeutic guide into what works for the client. It can also help with therapeutic alignment. Again, this can be a guide or a blueprint. You start to see through understanding of history can lend itself to effective or, or, or ineffective therapeutic relationships, really understanding the history. Um, and if you can understand a little bit of the history even before you meet the client, um, the hope is, is that well, this will lend itself to more effective therapeutic relationships. Um, also, this is no guarantee. Um, these are only benefits toward planning and design of treatment plans and goals um, and effects into the client, uh, the therapeutic relationship and maybe moving uh, a client down a continuum um, of change. Um, but this doesn't guarantee um, uh, you know, that, that it will be more successful or, or less successful. So plans, placements, and treatment courses. So plans, when you're starting to create that plan, and when you're starting to work through with a client with a substance use disorder, um, I think of this also uh, a lot of times on the outpatient basis when you're trying to work with a client to get them maybe into a higher level of care for substance use disorders. Um, you start to talk about attainable, a deliverable, and adaptable goals. The other piece is there might be some contingencies and boundaries to start to think about when you start to think about the planning. Um, if you have someone that isn't uh, necessarily achieving their goals, say they're trying to reduce or, or sustain abstinence from a certain substance, um, and they're it's continuing to place themselves or maybe others at risk because of it, um, there might be some contingencies and some boundaries that need to be put in place. Placement factors, um, when you start to talk about that dimension six, um, factors associated with placements, location, ages, profession, um, substances, co-occurring condition, comorbid conditions, um, you know, life stages. So there is, there might be a very different uh, placement course with, um, with someone that is 20 versus someone that's 70. Um, that's just just do the nature of the life stage, maybe some of the comorbid medical conditions that are present, um, whether someone has a trauma history and anxiety condition outside of their substance use disorders. All of this makes up a, um, a guide for, for the ability for placement. I'm going to bring this up again with the treatment codes. What we're looking at is a holistic approach. We're looking at the whole being person-centered, um, unique but similar approach to patient care. Um, look at the physical, emotional, social, spiritual, and mental well-being of the client um, and what they need as they move forward in their treatment design. So for practice behaviors, client alignment is critical. Um, you know, this is uh, continued with the uh, importance of the therapeutic relationship. Um, sometimes when I was uh, supervising uh, newer clinicians, um, you know, and there was a there was a disagreement of well, this client isn't doing something that's healthy for them. Um, oftentimes we would talk about the rationale of why that client is reacting or behaving that way. And it was oftentimes a really good rational reason why they would be doing so. So not necessarily saying that you agree with what a client's decision or what the um, action that a client might, might take 
um, but understanding an alignment that you know you have an understanding and an empathetic response to what they're going through and the choices that they are making. Um, again, leads into that motivational interviewing and the importance of motivational interviewing when working with um, clients trying to move down this um, this continuum of care or this um, this uh, uh, this this mode of change. Um, and behavioral change takes time. So often, you know, we, we're not going to start one place and, and next session, we're going to be in a completely different place. So whether that's inpatient, outpatient, partial hospitalization, or anywhere in between, um, it does take some time for behavioral change to occur. Ability to adapt. This is speaking really to the clinician um, and the ability to adapt with your client. Um, there are certainly crises that come up that take precedence, excuse me, take precedence at that time. And as that therapeutic relationship builds, as that client alignment continues, you have the ability to challenge your clients more. Um, again, something that I, I really focused on when in any kind of supervisory factory, fact, any super, supervision or, or supervising anyone is the ability to build that so that you can potentially push a little bit harder to create more fat, you know, a faster level of change potentially. Um, but you need to have that alignment and that, that good therapeutic relationship to be able to challenge and to push a little bit more um, uh, for that, for the goals that potentially your clients are trying to achieve. Practice skills and building trust, understanding, empathy, clarity, authenticity, reflecting, summarizing, acknowledging, listening, self-management. Um, these practice skills are a reflection of, uh, of a lot of what positive psychology uh, talks about and really that therapeutic alignment within that client um, and being able to really, and one of them is reflecting, but really reflect your, what you're hearing, your understanding um, and your compassion towards that client's plight and what they're going through. So we're going to talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on self-reliance and self-determination. Um, certainly one of the self-determination piece, uh, every client has their, has a right for self-determination. So that's one of the core principles of working with uh, within this field. So self-reliance being the reliance on one's own powers and resources other than than others. Um, and this is really the building of what we're trying to maintain within our client. I always told my clients, you know, my goal isn't for you to be in therapy your whole life. Um, you know, if you want to be, and it's, it's like a, a soft place for you as you move forward, but my goal is for you to build the skills necessary so you, that you can take these forward and implement them in your life so that you can build the self-reliance and self-determination, the internal self-reliance and self-determination. And these are just the, the, the pieces that make up that self-resilience, re, self-reliance, excuse me, self-reliance. Um, that, and really it comes down to that acceptance of yourself, being your own best friend, that inner confidence, um, that de de decisions of who you want to be and the goals of how you get there, um, recognizing and managing the dependence and whether that's behavioral dependence, whether that's relationship dependence, whether that's substance dependence, um, when it comes to alcohol or, or other illicit substance, um, there can be dependence on a, a multitude of things and making your own decisions and having your own values. Self-determination, again, critical when working with our clients, person's ability to make choices and manage their own life. Three components of self-determination, competence, connection, autonomy. This is about fulfillment, the, the ability to um, to feel good about yourself and move forward in your own life, that achievement, success, and skills that you have things to offer, um, that you have competence for offering, whether that be relationships, work, or other, um, connections, that belonging and attachment, whether that be friendships, whether that's um, partners or, or, um, or, or mothers or fathers, that, that, that belonging, that connection, that cultural and societal effect on you, um, and autonomy and the motivation that, that can do of achievement, um, that, that empowering our clients, that they can be successful and they can maintain and they can continue forward. 
Ethical quagmires, um, duty to warn, uh, we've seen this, I'm sure, many, many, many times, the obligation of mental health pro professionals to warn third parties whom their clients intend to harm or who might be able to protect a suicidal client from self-harm. Um, and this is an interesting, when you start to kind of tease it out, um, issue when it comes to substance use disorders. So, you know, when you start talking about self-harm, um, if you have a client that you're working with that has potential uh, multiple overdoses, potentially in the last couple of months, um, we all know about the opiate epidemic that's, uh, that's ongoing. Um, you know, the reality is, is when they leave your office, um, you know, the potential outcome could be devastating um, if, if someone is actively using um, or uh, take a very different approach to opiates when you start talking about alcohol use disorders. Um, if someone uh, regularly drinks and drives, I mean, that's definitely risk, you know, risk to others. Um, however, they're not identifying uh, them drinking and driving with anyone else in the car. Um, you know, there's a lot of ethical pieces that that kind of fit in here. And what is our practice and duty? What is our duty as clinicians? What is our duty um, for that client? Um, when does self-determination, self-determination, resilience, and 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 how do we how do we come to terms with all of that? So it's a it's it's a very complex question of when is the intervention point for the clinician themselves. Um, what I would say is pick your pick your spots pick your stances, plan, 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 know your client, have a backup plan, um, and know your rights as, as, a, as a direct practitioner. Um, and if you're getting into a situation where you are feeling, um, you know, that, that this is, that they, that this client might act, you know, if you're on an outpatient, they really need inpatient treatment um, to create some barriers and some boundaries for yourself within that relationship so that that person can get the help that they need. Um, and certainly this could be a life or death situation. Um, and if there is a serious risk of life or injury, um, it's really about duty and certainly duty to your client. This is kind of leveling the continuum care models of uh, level of care and also substance use disorder. Um, I guess supposedly you should be able to match mild to outpatient, moderate to PHP, severe to inpatient or sober living. Um, however, very, very complicated and very, very um, complex. The human condition is complex. Uh, histories, um, co-occurrings, comorbids, family systems, environmental effects, all of these things have to be given their proper place to be given um, recommendations or level of cares or for placement. Um, and helping your client along that continuum so that they can get to where they need. Um, again, a very complicated, uh, it's a very complex situation to be in um, as a clinician and also as a client themselves. There is a possibility of change. I mean, this is why we're all here. This is why we do what we do. Um, and recovery rates, and if you haven't seen the literature that Dr. Kelly put out um, from Stanford, I would highly encourage you to do so, um, has shown a 75% recovery rate. Um, for those that seek inpatient, those that seek, excuse me, those that seek treatment have that 75% recovery rate. Um, and that's a very big change of what historically we have thought within the industry. Um, actually, the median, um, uh, the median uh, number of treatments is two for that 75% recovery rate. So um, the, the notion that, you know, the revolving door notion that people would be in and out of treatment um, for their whole life is just uh, is actually just a fallacy. It's not uh, it's not supported by uh, any literature that's out there. Um, and certainly supportive environmental factors increase overall success rates. That's why I have um, really dedicated the last year focusing on recovery centric um, work environments and how to better support individuals um, in and returning from uh, treatment of uh, behavioral health and substance use disorders. So I just wanna say to everyone, thank you very much um, for your time today. And uh, you guys are really the frontline workers and the heroes out there. So I really appreciate everyone and what they do. 
um, for their clients and their colleagues in, in supporting mental health, behavioral health, and uh, substance use, uh, uh, treatment of substance use disorders and prevention. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, so we're now gonna answer some of the questions that got submitted through the registration process. Uh, if we have time after those, um, we can answer some of the questions that came through the Q&A. Uh, so that function is still open. If you have any specific questions for Eric or the presentation, uh, please feel free to ask in there. Um, so Eric, we've got some good ones in the pre-registration process. So I'll just kind of go through a few of them uh, that whatever we have time for, we can get through. Um, when can ambulatory detox be utilized um, and with which substances and protocols, risks, et cetera? So, so ambulatory detox, um, it's a really, really good question. Um, what I would say is certainly the evaluation of a medical provider, having a doctor um, clear someone for ambulatory privilege is, is, is a necessity, working with, in collaboration with your medical team to determine that, whether that be a nurse practitioner or a doc. Um, there's a couple of different substances you concern yourself with a little bit more. Um, you, nowadays, typically benzodiazepine and alcohol, just with uh, seizure and fall risks. Um, and... You know, the big piece with ambulatory detox is, especially within a, 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 you know, talking about an inpatient treatment setting is you really want the individual to start to pro, start to program outside of the medical unit um, with the community. It's such a big part of that healing process. So it's, it is a balancing act. When do you, when do you release someone so that they can continue, so they can start their treatment and start to really um, uh, be supportive by the community, which is so vital um, in a safe way. So uh, what I would also say to that is, is making sure that someone is around and available so that they can continue to assess um, their potential fall risks or other concerns that might be just because they're released on ambulatory detox, um, that they have eyes on them just in case something would happen. That's great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I'm thinking this is specific to co-occurring disorders. Um, do you treat the substance use disorder first or the psychiatric issues first? Another good question. So I would say history and assessments typically dictate that. Um, if someone is, if someone has a history uh, of, uh, of psychological, behavioral, or psychiatric conditions, um, and has then is then entering treatment for a substance use disorder, you treat them both. Um, you treat them both uh, together. Um, I think of, uh, again, just with my own history, trauma, trauma, trauma conditions, post-traumatic stress, and, and otherwise, um, you know, if you would have said this 20 years ago, you would say, hey, we treat the substance use disorder, and then you treat the trauma. Um, research and, and the evidence says elsewise, and, and most individuals are actually treating trauma co-occurring and substance use disorders at the same time um, because the, uh, the outcomes are better, better outcomes for long-term recovery. Um, however, with that being said, if there are potential co-occurring such as like anxiety, depression, for instance, that are new um, that occurred after uh, the the person started to uh, potentially abuse the substances that they that they're abusing. Um, that very well might be a symptom of the use itself. And what you would want to do is you would want to um, treat the substance use disorder primarily first, and then hopefully it, it's more of a result of the substance use than a standalone co-occurring condition. Fantastic, thank you. Um... What key indicators would you use to determine when an individual is ready to move on to a next level of care? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I would say it's different. It's different for it. It's really, it's really different for each client. Um, I would definitely work, look at history and the assessments. I'd look at the SAM placement criteria, um, where they were when you started treating them and where they are when you're starting to do your evaluation for potential level of care assessment. 
Um, where have they made progress? What is still um, going on for them? So for instance, I'll, I'll just throw, throw an example out there. Um, you know, if, if someone had, enters treatment and they have maybe some anxiety, depression present, but that was substance use related, um, that clears up. Um, they had environmental concerns, um, however, they're not going to be returning to that same environment that they came from. If you start to work through the, the ASAM criteria, and some of these things have now been resolved, um, the placement look, might look very different than someone that has, uh, you know, trauma, uh, you know, trauma, current trauma symptoms that are presenting real time in place after the removal of the substance, anxiety, co-occurring conditions, an environment that might not, not be conducive uh, to support recovery, that might, you might be looking at a higher level of care um, uh, for that individual. Great. Um, this one should be, should be quick and easy. It popped up in the, the Q&A. Can you repeat the doctor's name um, from Stanford that you referenced? Oh yeah, Dr. John Kelly. Uh, he, is, uh, he is a renowned addiction uh, doctor. He heads addiction uh, for Stanford um, and uh, works with our, uh, uh, our Karen uh, research team um, in Warnersville as well as a consultant for us. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for just about one more before we start closing out. Um, where can clients go before and during substance treatment with regards to being a healthy recovery environment and beginning or continuing their recovery? So, um, uh, clarificational question. Um, I think what they're asking, um, and, and maybe I'll answer this a couple of different ways, um, certainly uh, supportive environmental pieces could be uh, self-help groups, um, could be uh, if they have any kind of religious affiliations or organizations, uh, community centers, um, you know, there are certainly different living environments uh, when you talk about sober livings and, and uh, uh, continued living uh, houses that also support um, substance-free lifestyles. Um, so there's a lot of different options out there when you start to talk about uh, things that to continue to support growth. Um, maybe that's even, you start to talk about the, whole, the holistic approach of nutrition uh, seeking, seeking out nutritionists, um, other uh, exercise routines, other um, pieces where you're starting to start to think about that whole, that whole being, um, and how do you continue to not only focus on a substance-free lifestyle, but also focus on um, your overall uh, health and well-being. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so that wraps up the time for questions. So we'll start closing out here. Um, so of course, thank you, Eric, for the informative presentation. And of course, to all our attendees today for joining us. Um, just a reminder, this, pre this presentation is eligible for one continuing education credit. Uh, just keep your eye out on your email for a link from cego.com. That'll send you your evaluation. Um, so Karen has another exciting webinar in the works uh, coming up here on March 23rd. Please join us for Mutual Support and Recovery, an Evolving Landscape. Uh, this has also been approved for one CE credit and will run from 12 noon to one o'clock, just like today's. Uh, you can also visit us at karen.org backslash webinars, um, and that'll give you a full list of everything we have coming up for, uh, for webinars. Um, you can also check your emails. Uh, we'll send out more information about upcoming webinars. Uh, additionally, Karen's Education Alliance has substance use prevention, intervention, and resources for parents, businesses, and youth serving professionals. Karen's Digital Education has targeted education and programs designed to be completed at your own pace. Uh, in the meantime, please reach out to your local regional resource director at any time for additional information, resources in your area, questions regarding admission to Karen's programs. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Eric. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon.